A very good evening and greetings to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Indeed, it's my privilege and honor to welcome you all for this uh, another opportunity to come together in this season of Lent. As we have this uh, midweek uh, Lenten meditation every Tuesday, uh, we are thankful to God for giving us uh, such an opportunity once again uh, to come together in God's presence and to listen to God's word and to revisit our commitment, especially during the season of Lent. I'm sure that uh, this uh, session will be a meaningful one, as uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Evangeline Anderson and Dr. Kumar Nam with us. So uh, before I welcome uh, uh, officially uh, Dr. Evangeline for this uh, gathering, uh, we will begin this session with a word of prayer, and we will have a hymn uh, so that we can listen to the hymn. And then uh, I can uh, say a few words of introduction about the Evangeline. And then uh, I can give the time to the Evangeline so that she can share the word of God with us. Let's look to God and pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the gift of life and everything that you have given in all our lives. Thank you for bringing us together once again in your presence to listen to the word of God and to revisit our commitment in you to understand the in-depth message of the scriptures. God, as we are journeying through the season of Lent, you are guiding us and you are inspiring us through various ways and means. God, we commit this time of prayer and meditation unto your mighty hands. We especially pray for all those who have joined in this meeting from across the different parts of this world. And we especially pray for Dr. Evangelion, who is going to share the meditation to us this evening. God, you be with her and uh, to her words. We can listen to your voice and we can understand the will and purpose for our life especially in this season of Lent. God, we commit this time of uh, prayer and meditation unto your mighty hands. Be with us and guide us. We pray this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So now we will listen to this uh, hymn so that uh, we can prepare ourselves for the meditation and then we will listen to the uh, word of God.
So now let me <coughs> say a few words of introduction about uh, our ma'am, my professor. And, uh, uh, I can uh, I can be very sure that uh, simple words of introduction can never comprehend what Dr. Evangeline Ma'am had contributed in our lives, uh, especially during the uh, days of our formation, uh, during my studies uh, uh, at United Theological College where I did my Bachelor of Divinity. So since I need to formally uh, introduce Ma'am for this uh, meditation, before this meditation, uh, I was trying to confine myself without saying so many things, but uh, I feel that I, I, I won't be doing justice if I confine myself. Dr. Evangeline, if I had to introduce her, uh, she is the person who holds so many firsts in her life. So she was the first one to serve as a permanent women faculty in the United Theological College, Bangalore. And she was the... <coughs> Uh, 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 she was the first Lutheran woman to serve as the vice president of uh, the UELCI in 2006. Uh, and also she served as the president uh, of the Association of Theologically Trained Women of India. So uh, the, Dr. Evangeline had never failed in any opportunity given to her to inspire people and especially inspire uh, theological students uh, to take up the challenge uh, in their life and in their uh, face of ministry. So Dr. Evangeline taught in Sarampur College as well as in uh, United Theological College of Bangalore for about two decades and then um, uh, now she is in the United States of America and there also she had uh, different uh, teaching positions in different universities earlier. Uh, now she is in pastoral ministry with the Evangelical Lutheran Churches in America. Uh, at present, she is taking care of two uh, congregations in uh, Indiana. Um, uh, Dr. Evangeline, uh, is, uh, to, uh, I, when I met her um, uh, during my academic guidance program uh, in 2010, uh, 2011, I remember. So uh, in the very first class itself, uh, ma'am, challenged our perspectives about patriarchy and our uh, constructions on language and how we need to uh, reread the scriptures from the feminist perspective. So more than a teacher, uh, she was uh, very close to us, uh, guiding uh, us like a mother, sister, and a friend. Uh, so it was always a privilege to listen to ma'am and we feel that uh, why the class hour is going very quick when Dr. Evangeline is teaching us. So I'm so happy that uh, Dr. Evangeline uh, uh, consented our invitation to be with us during the season of Lent and to share the uh, meditation. So when I was thinking about this reflection from uh, the book of Esther, immediately uh, Nam only popped out in my mind and I remember the play Vasti uh, that we had in UTC. Uh, I think uh, that had challenged quite a lot of people uh, in that particular time. Uh, so without uh, taking much time, uh, let me uh, give this time to Dr. Evangeline. And uh, I should also mention that uh, we had uh, uh, Dr. Chungi also with us uh, two weeks back in our church. Uh, she shared about the Bible Society of India. So that time itself, I, uh, I said with our congregation that this is sister-in-law of Dr. Evangeline. So it was so, uh, of course, it was coincidence. We never uh, expected Shingi, uh, Ma'am Shingi to be with us on that evening. But it was so surprised that he also shared something uh, during our evening service. So thank you so much, Ma'am. So on behalf of uh, the church, and especially on behalf of uh, the chairman and our bishop, uh, uh, Right Reverend Dr. S. 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 And also our presbyter in charge, Reverend Moses Jabrak, who is also your student uh, from uh, Sarampur College, and uh, our honorary presbyter, uh, Reverend Dr. Samuel Stuart Aya, and also on my behalf and my family, we welcome you, ma'am, to share this meditation with us. So now the time is yours, and over to you. Ma'am, you are muted. So muted. 
Thank you, Andrew, for those beautiful words of introduction. And uh, just one little correction is that uh, I was the first woman permanent faculty member in Serampo College Theology Department. Uh, just that. And uh, how we mutually challenge and learn every time based on the word of God, how we are formed and reformed every time in our lifespan, in our uh, entire life, is sheer God's grace. So we pray and hope that even in this season of Lent, we will go back to those very preliminary questions in life and ask God, what is that purpose that you have for me? I believe in that ever presence and that promise that God has for not just myself, but for the whole world. So we begin with that prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this beautiful time that you have given us to ponder upon your word. We pray that you would open the eyes and ears of our hearts and you. So that those seeds of life may be sown. And that we may bear fruit a 30, a 60, a hundredfold. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Being the third reflection on uh, in the season of Lent, I would like to begin with this question. What is liberation? What is the purpose of looking at this whole period of Lent and recovering from there the meaning and significance of liberation. What is it that we need to be liberated from and liberated to? And in order to focus on that question, I would also like us to keep before us the cross the meaning and significance of the cross during this Lenten season. And once again, ask, what is this repentance from and repentance to? Because this period of Lent is not just a time of cessation of some of the things that we usually love and say, all right, we can give it up. It has nothing to do with that. Rather, you repent, you realize that sense of remorse comes. It is the cross that opens your mind, your heart anew to look at those actions, those things values that we cling on to as precious and look therein how much of it is closer to the heart of God, closer to the purpose for which God has created you and I. So with this in mind, let us enter into our time of reflection from the book of Esther. This is one of my favorite books in the Bible, not because the word India comes right in the first verse of that uh, first chapter of the book of Esther. Very often you find uh, commentaries, opinions shared about the book of Esther saying, how come this book made it into the Bible? as one of the books, because the word God doesn't appear there at all. What is the significance of this book in the Bible? Instead of asking, what criteria do we lay down 
to a certain a certain book is of importance greater importance or of lesser importance instead of going along those lines if we can ask this primary question how does the word of god challenge us to look at the preliminary the primary principles of life that god has god has always had and shared with the whole of humanity right from the time of creation right from the time of creation so this book consists of you know uh, it's impossible to reflect on the book of esther without at least sharing a very brief story about as uh, the book of esther of course it starts with that king ahasuerus who would like to throw off a party and invite people and the primary reason why he does that is of course to emphasize on power as exercised as uh claimed and you find that it is in that context of sharing his idea of power his idea of god his idea of everything absolute that he also feels that he has not been respected that he has that he is forced to challenge his own perception of the absolute of power because washti has the nerve to say no to the king now why i talk about ahasuerus is because you find the character of ahasuerus as a very prominent character as a paradigmatic character in our own lifetime a character who for whom power abusive power regardless of relationship if that is his idea of good idea of power that is ahasuerus and who in the course of the story we realize didn't even bother to go into the request that haman makes but simply offers his signet ring offers shares his power with those he feels understands and accepts his own power no one should be a threat to his own power and he is willing to share power quote and quote the signet ring with those who accept that status quo and we find that this character of ahasuerus from the beginning to the end and we will see later on how that gets challenged the character of haman of course as one who sticks up two powers and who once again imitates the same value of deifying power so much so that he feels personally and morally offended when someone quote unquote disrespects his understanding of power the character of mordecai who does not rise up who does not show the respect that haman expects and therefore that vengeance that desire to annihilate not just one person one family but the whole generation it doesn't matter because they are all connected to one another it there's a continuity between an individual and the community to such an extent that 
this hatred that Haman generates within his body can be transferred onto other bodies, however many it may be. It doesn't matter. The body becomes that site where this mass destruction, weapon of mass destruction of hatred is generated and it's produced. And it goes on unrelenting. This craze for power, continuity in power. And therefore you find that his whole frame of mind, his whole world, once again becomes absolutizing power, deifying power. And that is something we need to keep before our minds when we do this character study and ask this question, how do we occupy our own bodies in terms of power? What kind of power is held, exercised in our own bodies? And what kind of power do we ascribe to bodies? Because at any given time, we are all human beings who occupy space at a particular time. And we occupy that space in terms of power and relationship. I would like us to keep this in focus because when we come to that person of Esther, we will see how Esther changes, challenges the way of occupying space. How do you transcend those barriers? Maybe gender, it may be identity, it may be even that quote unquote vulnerable status of being an orphan, being, you know, one who has no roots, nothing that she can claim as something elevated, something great for her to exercise her role, her agency, her voice. But we will see later how this power, the body, the woman, Esther, can find her own voice at a time when that voice is counted as a threat, when her presence itself is counted as a threat. So we look at that as well. Mordecai character is also very important in the sense that Mordecai one who plays the role of a foster parent, who, who acknowledges the power of his role, the possibility of the role that he can play in society, rather than just pay lip service to that relationship, he goes a step further and says, he does kind of help Esther to, you know, it's like giving her that heads up, giving her that leg up to say, get on with life. There is a purpose. There is a purpose. To find a purpose for each one, each other, is a beautiful role. I do not want to idealize and, uh, you know, prop up Mordecai as a very positive example, because later on in the same book of Esther, when the reversal of roles take place, when Mordecai comes into that site of power, when he is instated as the person in charge, Mordecai continues that line of violence and justifies the killing of the enemies of Jews. And that's where we need to Look at the Bible, read the Bible, reread the Bible, not to derive from it 
justification of violence, legitimizing of that structure of violence, systemic violence within the framework of revenge, within the framework of violence and injustice. So you have these four characters present. Even if the name God does not appear in the book of Esther, definitely you have the presence of everything that aligns with the larger perspective and the principle of life and justice in this book. For me, I see Esther as the Old Testament Mary Magdalene, a woman who doesn't have any ascribed expectations of her body. One whose starting point is actually devaluation as a woman. It's enough if you are a symbol of beauty. It's enough if you are a symbol of a wife, etc. Nobody expects her to play the role of a savior. Nobody expected her to be pushed into that role. But then you find that the way God's plan works is to choose a person who stands as the least expected, the least qualified within the patriarchal framework, within the patriarchal expectations. And God's, you know, this is the most consistent and constant thing in God's plan that we see. That God can choose Mary, a virgin's womb, to, in this whole plan of salvation. You see that, you know, also in this case of, uh, if you want to, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we had the reading of Abraham and Sarah and the promise of, uh, you know, generations that will fill the earth like the stars of the sky and chooses a person, you know, uh, a couple who would be the least qualified, but simply in terms of their body. Sarah, who has passed the age or, you know, the old age, human expectations, human criteria. Want to see this in Elizabeth? So the pattern is very familiar. So the constant thing for me there is that God, you know, this, this purpose of God in using people as instruments in God's plan is something that we need to highlight. It is pure grace of God that God uses people, human beings. And this is also because this grace is not to be monopolized, claimed as someone's private property. God's grace is for all. And that is something that you keep right at the root of the message of salvation, message of the cross. So I constantly go back to this person of Esther as one who, especially, you know, because in a, in a context where the historicity of the book is questioned. I would like us to look at this narrative, the story of the book of Esther as a way to underscore the point that God's way, God has never ever abandoned the world of God's presence. God does not work in, it's not part-time job for God. To say, I'll come back to you later, I have other things to do. So for God, 
God's time to, you know, for people to understand that this grace is constant and how we can embody that grace every time is a calling, is a demand, is what God requires of us. The point about Esther choosing or not choosing to use her voice, her body at, in that space, you see that in spite of the vulnerabilities that are multiplied, that get so complicated in her situation, where there seems to be a choice, at least, you know, Mordecai says, you can, you can be safe even if you are in the king's house because the edict that has passed on from the power, from Haman, is to annihilate all the Jews. You can't escape. You find that there is that possibility for Esther to say, uh, I tried I couldn't, I don't think I can. I am rather new to this place, to this job. Instead, for Esther to put her life on the line because she is able to see something beyond those barriers, to see something beyond as worthwhile and that is the affirmation of life, the affirmation of community, to uphold a community, to uphold relationships, that there can be no power, absolutely no power on earth that can negate the purpose of God for the world. In other words, no one, nobody, nobody can ever claim any just war, a just framework, legitimize anything in order to say, I want one section of people off from the face of the earth. That just doesn't happen. So to be able to see that as a principle of life, something that can guide us in our own thinking, in our own understanding and reading of the Bible is so important, especially in a context like ours when the wars are happening, violence happens. And in a very specific context where Christian bodies are targeted, the question, the challenge for the Christian community, the church, as much as, you know, for all of us, is this. We can't afford to be troubled only when the church is persecuted. We can afford to be troubled only when People, our people are annihilated. It is important for us to look for the good, the welfare, the justice of everyone. What does God require of us, O oh mortals, but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God? This, this hermeneutical principle, this critical principle has to become the primary principle for us to see the whole of the purpose of God for us. The purpose of God for us to be those bodies where the understanding of life, life breath and dignity is honored and elevated, affirmed mutually in everyone, regardless. That comes out as the primary thing. So what is it that we need to 
repent of what is it that we need to repent to turn to so it is turning away from something yes we turn away from passivity apathy we turn to god and engage be in solidarity with forces people actors who support life we cannot ever assume to be christian in isolation christianity our faith our religion is not to belong to a club and that is exactly where i would like to place this challenge of using our voice you know dietrich bonhoeffer one of my favorite theologians he says silence in the face in the time of evil is evil itself for not to speak is to speak for not to act is to act meaning when we don't act when we opt for silence we collude with powers that's how serious silence is especially in the face of injustice especially when you know that speaking up and speaking out would hurt your own interest your 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 community your family that's exactly where we are challenged to ask god help me to widen the frontiers of my faith so that i will be able to recognize confess affirm and accept that everyone is created in the image of god and that will be the primary gelling factor the factor that binds us together as one family i would uh, challenge and offer this as uh, the message for us especially during this lenten time lent is a god given moment to look deep within like we read in the story of the prodigal son where he takes time he puts those very precious questions to himself first and what we read is then he came to himself what does it mean to come to oneself esther did she came to herself in the way she puts those preliminary questions what do i do how do i do what do i say because the ultimate is to change that future for the better for the whole community to change that future from the point of annihilation to life continuity of life and if we can discern from this book those very preliminary principles of life yes god's presence promise and plan and purpose for the world is sacred for all for all so for us to hope that there will be many esters in our own church and society critical voices that are firm and participate in this justice may god bless us all amen
thank you so much ma'am uh, for the wonderful reflection of course uh, as usual it is a uh, reflection uh, with uh, great passion and commitment and definitely uh, we all are inspired by the message and it is very relevant to revisit our commitment and to analyze uh, the space time and uh, power in the life uh, realities and uh, it's very meaningful that how we have to reorient ourselves uh, uh, from this space and this power and where we have to repent to and to ensure life uh, that is very interesting uh, it was challenging as usual uh, to listen to us after a, uh, a long time so thank you so much ma'am uh, for joining us this evening so uh, i am also happy to uh, acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, some of our friends uh, uh, i think uh, simpa was here and uh, reverend calvin shishi tambler and uh, yeah uh, very uh, some of the familiar people uh, have joined us uh, this evening so on behalf of the church we welcome you all uh, for this uh, invitation so ma'am uh, shall i request you to offer a word of prayer and share the grace uh, so that we can uh, wind up this let us pray Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this beautiful time that you gave us to connect and reconnect with each other as well as with the word, the word of life that you have given us. We pray that these moments will be so blessed for us so that we are a blessing to everyone we meet and we pray that the thoughts shared this morning this evening will be will bear fruit in our own lives so that we participate in that process of love life and justice that you call us to we pray specially for the situation in ukraine we pray that your presence that people will have that sense of responsibility to stop the violence call out those who are responsible for the violence and we pray that you would raise many esters in our own context those who will be able to question and challenge powers like of hama we pray that you will inspire us to lead a life worthy of your calling and to bear fruits of repentance in our life use us o oh lord one more time every time we ask this prayer in the precious name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen and now may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the communion of the holy spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore amen thank you ma'am thank you so much uh, for joining us and it was a very meaningful time for all of us